Pixar, and I am a woman of Pixar. <laughs> At Pixar, we're proud of all of our characters, but this group that you're going to meet today is especially proud of the likes of Jesse, Dory, Sally, Elastigirl, Merida, and my personal favorite, Mrs. Squibbles. <laughs> But what you may or may not know is I am equally impressed with the women I find myself surrounded by every day at our studio. So today, I would love to introduce to you some of those women and have them share their stories and their journeys and the lessons that they've learned along the way. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to a few of them. First up is Brett Parker. Since joining the studio, she has worked as an animator on several Pixar films, including A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters, Inc., and the Academy Award-winning animated features Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, Brave, and Monsters University. <laughs> she is currently working as both an animator and animation tools lead on Pete Doctor's next film, Inside Out. Let's hear it for Brett. <laughs> next up is Galen Sussman. Galen joined Pixar Animation Studios in 1990 and worked on Pixar's TV commercial production as technical director, animated and animator, and producer. Her first work on a feature film was for Toy Story, where she modeled, shaded, and supervised lighting. She then worked on Bud's Life and served as supervising technical director on Toy Story 2 and as simulation and effects supervisor for Monsters, Inc. In 2007, she worked as the associate producer for the Academy Award-winning animated film, Ratatouille, and most recently, Galen was a producer for the DVD promo department at Pixar. She's producing Pixar's first TV special that some of you may have seen bits of throughout the weekend, Toy Story of Terror. <laughs> That's the big year in fall 2013. Let's hear it for Galen Sussman. <laughs> Next, we have Mary Alice Drum. Mary Alice was the associate producer of the Academy Award-winning feature film, Brave. Prior to Pixar, she worked as a digital producer on the Henson Company, Sid and the Science Kid, as a line producer on the feature film, Curious George, and an associate producer on the Disney's direct-to-video film, Cinderella 2, Dreams Come True. Currently, Mary Alice is overseeing the production teams at Pixar Canada on a number of our Toy Story and Cars tunes. Let's hear it from Mary Alice. <laughs> Next up is Lindsay Collins. Lindsay joined Pixar Animation Studios in 1997. Her film credits include A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, and the Academy Award win winning Finding Nemo and Ratatouille. She co-produced the Academy Award-winning feature, WALL-E, and was producer on the Walt Disney Studios feature, John Carter. Lindsay also provided, little known fact, Lindsay also provided the voice of the character of Mia in Cars. And she is currently producing the upcoming Finding Dory with director Andrew Stanton. Let's do it. And last but not least, Mary Coleman. Mary Coleman joined Pixar Animation Studios in 1999 as a senior development executive. Since then, she has contributed to the development of just about every film at Pixar, including our most recent release, Monsters University. She's currently hard at work with the filmmaking teams on all of our upcoming films slated through 2017. Let's hear it for Mary. Anyway, I think we've assembled a hell of a group for you guys, so let's get to some questions for them. Okay, ladies, where do we start? 
I think I'd like to know personally, because I don't know all of their stories, what their journey was that led them to Pixar. So if you guys could just walk us through, each of you briefly, your journey to Pixar and what made you realize and where along the way that animation was where you wanted to be. So maybe we can start with Brett. Okay. Um, I come to animation kind of not through a traditional route. My background is actually in performance and theater and film, and I was actually hired originally at Pixar as a temp PA for a three-month stint. Um, and <laughs> I know, right? So um, that turned into a, a full-time PA position, and it was while I was at Pixar that I was like, wow, animation makes so much sense to me. There's choreography and acting and timing, and so I just started to stay late and um, teach myself not only the software, but also um, through, you know, willing volunteers and kind of casual mentorship from the other animators, um, the principles of animation. And I put together a reel, actually it was reviewed by Pete Doctor, and they hired me on as what was, um, at the time, it was the first um, fixed animation position, and that's the person who kind of does cleanup work. And it was the first time Pixar had ever had that as a position. And then from there, I just sort of continued to study and work my way up uh, and went back into 2D animation. And, and that was my, that's my story. So I started out in computer graphics as a, as a scientist, a research scientist. I was originally working over at Apple and um, developing new, this is dating myself a little bit, but um, the first color software for the first color Macintosh. <laughs> and we decided it'd be really cool if we tried to do a short film entirely on Macintosh computers and enter into SIGGRAPH, which had never had anything that wasn't produced on you know, large computers before. And I was working with um, a woman named, at the time, Nancy Tag, who later became Nancy Lasseter, John Lasseter's wife. And so the two of us started working on this project together, and John um, was her boyfriend, and he would sit down and give us animation tutorials and teach us how to animate. And we were writing the software as fast as we were, were trying to animate. It's like, oh, it needs to be able to move. Quick, write that software. So it's a little crazy, and we got the project done, and it was, it was just a thrill. It was tremendous fun. And I realized at the time that I was having a lot more fun making the film and the filmmaking aspects of the project than I was just in the writing of the software. And so when Pixar decided that they were going to do commercial animation, and I already knew John, he said, look, we're hiring. We want to come and be a generalist. And at the time, um, a generalist was sometimes I produced, sometimes I animated, sometimes I modeled and shaded. And it, was just, it was just about anything. We wore all hats. And I, that sounds perfect. So left Apple. Went to Pixar and have been there ever since for 23 years. Uh, my path to Pixar led to the very obvious choice of an internship on the soap opera General Hospital. Uh, that was my first gig, and I really was a big soap opera fan and thought I wanted to work at soap operas. And then I interned at General Hospital and decided I didn't. Um, <laughs> So I actually came out to Los Angeles incredibly naive about the film industry and just kind of drove out there ready to get a great job. And I was lucky enough to land at Warner Brothers when they were starting a feature animation division. And that was a great opportunity for me. And I loved animation. I'd grown up on the YouTube shorts and other things, but I really thought I wanted to work in live action. Um, but that was a great division. A lot of people that are at Pixar now were there. Uh, Mark Andrews, director of Brave, Steve Pilcher, Brad Bird was doing Iron Giant, obviously. Uh, so I had a great experience there, but then I did think I wanted to do live action, and so I left, and I did a really, really horrible live action direct-to-video film, and I realized, wow, I really miss animation. I love animation. And so I went back and I did um, different projects. I worked at Disney, and I worked at different studios. And then there was a job posting at uh, Pixar for Brave, associate producer. And I love the way the job description was written. And so I don't normally do a cover letter, but I did a very specific cover letter of how I loved the way the job was described. And then I found out that the posting had actually been written by Catherine Serafian, the producer of Brave. <laughs> so she, in my first interview with her, she said, I didn't really care about your resume, but I really loved your letter. 
and then I had 24 different sit-down interviews, and then I started at Pixar. Wow. <laughs> I didn't realize I was on the traditional route. I didn't have one that I would describe traditional either. I, um, I studied diplomacy and world affairs in college, um, never took a film class, um, and I graduated and had no job and went to live with my parents because I had no job. <laughs> and that was really horrifying, so I needed to get out as fast as possible. And then I had a couple, I knew a couple people who worked at Disney Feature Animation. And um, I, I'd done some internships and stuff in television while I was in college, just PA stuff, and so I was like, is there anything opening up in animation? And I really didn't know anything about um, how animation was made. And they, but I went in and I interviewed, and. Um, I was hired onto uh, the film Pocahontas um, at Disney Feature Animation. I was a PA and I was working with all the background painters um, and kind of helping them out. And then, um, I don't know, if some of you might have been in the earlier panel, but it, my, basically my job for the first year and a half was like um, those library, you know those library rubber stamps that, I don't know, Half of you were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, computer? Or, you know, like, you know, they used to have these rubber stamps that you have to move the numbers around and you'd stamp them. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was, so they basically I showed up and they handed me that stamp and then they would go like every piece of paper for the traditional animation needs to get stamped with the correct number of the scene and the sequence. And so they would bring in these literally these stacks of hand-drawn animated scenes that would just like be this high and I'd be sitting in a cubicle and I'd have to check the number and make sure and then stamp the bottom of the paper and move on all day long. It was like an Orwellian nightmare. I was like, they, they went to college, these people invented Space Mountain, can they not come up with something that does this? totally tempted over hours of time to just stamp the middle of the page. <laughs> you know, it's weird, like, I'm going to stamp the drawing. Because you were, it's, uh, anyway, so I did that for a long time. And then, um, apparently because I did that for a long time, they felt sorry for me and offered me a promotion to go work with the background painter. So I did that. And then I saw, um, I saw Toy Story. And I, uh, I mean, like everybody else, I think was completely blown away by Toy Story. It, like, almost didn't even make sense. Like I couldn't even process it as a as an audience member in terms. I didn't even know what it was I was seeing. All I knew was it was amazing, and I was um, in the process of signing up contract my contract at Disney uh, for three years. And I heard that um, Pixar was up in Northern California, and I'm from Northern California. And I was like, I I, I need to go. I want to go. Please, can I go work with those people? <laughs> And I saw this little video that they had done that was like this joke video of the research, this joke research age trip they did for A Bug's Life that was like ridiculous of them like looking for bugs in the center of the of like the highway. It was like their research trip and like they sent they submitted it from Pixar, these wacky guys at Pixar, and I was like, I need to go work with them. So I applied and heard nothing. And then I applied at ILM and ILM offered me a job. And then I had, and then Disney came with the contract, and I had, I was 24, 25, and I was like, okay, I need to sign the contract. So I signed the Disney contract, went home, threw up all night, and it's nothing to do with Disney. I mean, this was just, at all. It was just one of those moments in my life where it was like, you have made a bad decision, and my, I, my body was like, no, bad. And so I then went back and I said, turn down the contract, said I can't do it. I need to, I'm going to move home. I, I know I don't have a job or anything. And then Pixar called two days later and offered me a job on a bug site. So I don't know. I guess the I guess it all kind of happens for a reason, and the path is bizarre. Um, but I, I I knew the minute I started working at Disney, frankly, that these people they were like the most talented people I'd ever met in my life. From a, from a per, I mean from the PA to the director. So it was I was just like a whole world had been opened up. So it seems obvious. Wow. I've known these women for years, and I don't know these stories. <laughs> we should do this more often. <laughs> so interesting. So my story has something in common with Mike Wazowski's in Monsters University. Yes. Have all of you had a chance to see that? Yes. Good. I think it was a safe bet at D3 to draw this parallel and not have a spoiler for you. And so you know how Mike trains his whole life to be a scarer. It's all he wants and it's all he's ever trained for. 
but then it turns out that his true calling lies somewhere else, in the same field of scaring, but a different role. So that happened to me, and in my case, the thing I trained for my whole life was the theater, and I still love the theater. And I studied it in college, I got a master's degree in directing, I was very lucky to quickly start a directing career up in San Francisco. And I was like Mike Wazowski, I was technically good at it, and I worked very, very hard, but honestly, I was not a natural. And when you're doing a job, but you're not a natural fit, then you're not truly satisfied. But I wouldn't say I even knew that or would articulate it at the time, until one day, a patron at our theater named Rob Cook, he was one of the really early, you, yeah, he was one of the earliest Pixar computer software geniuses. So he and his wife came to see shows at our theater, and I had met him briefly as an acquaintance at one of the parties. And he called me out of the blue at the office, and he said, you know, I remember you said your favorite part of what you do is finding the playwrights and developing their scripts with them. And he said, so that made me think about something we need at Pixar. And I said, what is Pixar? <laughs> I've never heard of it. And he said, oh, you know, I work at this, um, this animation company, and we made Toy Story and A Bug's Life, and I'd never heard of them. And I even, and I'm so glad you forgave me for this, I even said, I don't really watch cartoons. <laughs> I know. I know, but he gave me another chance. And so, <laughs> what he said is, well, why don't you go rent these movies and just see if they interest you? Because he had this impulse that this could be a good fit. And I thought, well, now I'm just curious. I wasn't planning to take another job. You know, I had a job in this theater. I'd been there for over a decade. And so I went to my local video store, and I got my VHS tapes. That's how old I am. <laughs> and came home, popped them in, started with Toy Story. And like Lindsay, I was blown away. And you know, with all my years studying theater and plays, the level of storytelling, as you know, you're here to celebrate the kind of storytelling that Disney and Pixar and these places do, but the level of storytelling just blew my mind. And then Bugs Life was so funny, and the outtakes at the end of Bugs Life <laughs> actually fooled me. I really thought they were bloopers, and then I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> they had to draw, or they had to create all this in the computer, so. <laughs> just to see what they're like, because I was curious, who made these kind of movies? And I still didn't think it would be the job for me, because I don't know anything about animation. So, well, so even though I was somewhat recruited, because Pixar works this way, I had, I think, 17 interviews over two months, yeah? And my last interview was, was with John Lasseter. And I was prepared with my checklist to tell him about all my accomplishments. But instead, we had this real conversation because he came straight into my interview from a story session where they were grappling with the Toy Story 2 story. And he had, they had recently had this breakthrough that they wanted Woody to end up torn between two families, his old family at Andy's and his new family, the Roundup Gang. And that Woody had this dilemma and he was so torn and didn't know what to do. And when John was telling me this, he started to cry. This grown man, powerful director, creative head of the studio, was crying, talking about this character. And I realized he thinks of this character like his own brother. And I was so moved by his story. And I guess that's why I got the job, because I didn't say much in that interview. But I was a good listener, and I was truly moved by the story he was telling about Toy Story 2. And at that point, and you asked about, when did I know I wanted to work in animation? So I've been honest with you all that I don't, I didn't have an animation passion. I knew I wanted to work at Pixar in that moment with John. And then I really wanted the job, and then I had to wait a long time before they called. You know, they just are very, very thorough. But then I really, really wanted this job, and I've been there 14 years now.
can honestly say in my career, every single day, one of these ladies influences me. So I'd love to hear from all of you, who, who are the most important influences on your life? And what have you learned from them? So maybe let's start with Galen and move our way down this way. <laughs> For avoiding my contact. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Learn that. Um, well, that, it's, it's hard because you say influences, and you know, different people influence me so differently across time. Um, I had a professor in college, my um, thesis advisor in, in uh, graphics, and he he was phenomenal. Um, but we had a really difficult time. I was, I was working on my thesis, and I uh, was working with a gentleman, and he was really quite sexist. And so I went to my professor, and I said, you know what, I really don't think I can finish this project with this guy explaining what was going on. And I said, I, I, I want to change thesis topics. And he said to me, you know, aside from the fact that it, that will potentially delay your graduation, if you think it's going to be any different for you in the world, then what you're experiencing right now, you've got another thing coming. So, in fact, not only will I not let you switch, I won't graduate you unless you finish with him. And at the time, I was furious. And, you know, it, it was an amazing thing because then I called him on the phone after I had interviewed at Apple, and I said, they've offered me this position, and I'm, I'm thinking about not finishing my PhD. And he said, you know something, in industry, you're going to learn more than, than you would e you could ever learn. I mean, it's just such a phenomenal experience right now, what's happening in industry. Go. I would love it if you would come back and, and teach, because we need more women teaching at the professorial level in, in computer science. But, but go. And then I got to Apple, and that first day I walked into a first meeting, and they assumed that I was the new um, secretary. And I realized at that moment in time exactly the, the wonderful gift that that professor gave me by making me finish that thesis topic, and I have never regretted it. Anyone wow. else? Oh, um, I, was talking, I was talking about this this morning. I mean, there's so many influences. Um, on me. I, I'll say, I think one of the benefits for me of working at Pixar is I feel very grateful that there's so many people there and there's such an um, environment of mentorship. Um, and I think definitely for me, one person I've looked up to is Catherine Serafi and being the producer of Brave, bringing me into Pixar and helping me learn there. Um, and I think one thing, you know, that I've really learned from her is just really, I think, putting the films together is really about putting teams together and people together and trying to, to listen to people and really focusing on you know, how you give people information and specifically try and put yourself in that position of the other person when some of that information is hard. And that's something I'm definitely working on and learning a lot from Catherine and that. It didn't even occur to me not to think about that from a very early age, not that I knew what I wanted to do, but just think about um, working and always it never kind of occurred to me not to. Um, so that was obviously hugely influential. Um, and, and then currently, I would say um, that, uh, again, I know you probably have heard this a bunch if you've come to a lot of these sessions, but everybody at Pixar is, is insanely intelligent. Um, such that, I mean, Ed always is like, you always hire people smarter than you, which everybody all knows that nobody's smarter than Ed. So that's kind of a like nice room to say, but we're all like, yeah, okay, Ed. Um, but but uh, it is true, and I, and I think, um, I, I look at like PAs and, and coordinators coming in now, and I'm like, oh my God, I would never get hired today if I had to apply for this job. They're so impressive. Um, and I think as, as women in, at Pixar, I think, they are about as impressive as they come. I mean, in terms of they're they're very different. I mean, the women that I that I work with on a daily basis, in terms of their backgrounds, their experiences, their their approach to things. I mean, some of the most hardcore people I work with, in terms of the people that intimidate me the most, are the women I work with. And then I also work with women that are um, funny and lovely and 
um, and are the sweetest, nicest people um, on the planet. So it's such a diverse team. I wouldn't say that there's one type of woman that works at Pixar. I think that there's a swath, um, all of whom teach me something at any given time um, about how to be uh, better at my job and a better human being. Um, they, you know, I I'm learning all the time from those guys. So I, I mean, everybody here included. So it's it's super collaborative, and I think out of that you have to kind of appreciate that there, there's education coming at you all the time from every direction about yourself. So weird question. Sorry. <laughs> to have had a true mentor on my path. Um, it was a New York theater director named Ann Bogart, and I was assigned at one of the theaters where I worked to be her assistant director, and I had AD'd for other directors before who kind of treated me like the secretary, you know, asked if I knew how to make coffee, and I honestly don't, so I would just say, nope. One asked me for a neck rub, and I was like, oh, I'm terrible at that. So, <laughs> but then I, this, this woman director um, asked me my opinions, asked for my ideas, asked me to brainstorm with her about the, the script, about the play. And I also watched and learned from the way she asked the actors to really engage. She elicited from them personal resonance with the character they were playing. She let them find some of their own staging, which meant, which I saw in action made for the most natural staging I'd ever seen in the theater. And I was really, really inspired by her. And it was my first introduction to real artistic collaboration. And when I started at Pixar, collaboration is a key, key word at Pixar. And it's not just the rhetoric, we practice it every day and you have to be good at it. And it's not easy. It's not always easy. We have these, for me, it's story sessions where we brainstorm about the story, and sometimes people disagree on what would be the best way to make the story work, and you end up wrestling with it. And we love working together, but it can also be contentious. And it's so true that I've learned from all of the women at Pixar, in fact, all of my colleagues, in fact, Lindsay oversaw my department for several months between productions that she was producing. And it was so funny to hear that you studied diplomacy. I didn't know that. But what I, a big thing I learned just in that one summer was noticing these diplomacy skills. Because we're like a big family. <laughs> no, it's true. We're like a big family. And you know how in many families there'll be a middle child mediator? Have any of you ever been the mediator? And she is the mediator, and I sat back and watched and thought, oh, I could learn to do some of that. <laughs> so, you know what it is? It's like you always we joke that it's like, it's like it's family dinner. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. you know, yeah. basically, at least, and we're like, oh, Thanksgiving's coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's like every, every few months, there's going to be the dinner where there's the explosion around the dinner table. It's like, oh, I've always hated that you did that. You always do it with your mouth open. <laughs> um, and, it, and it is, but it is like a family in the sense that the honesty, I think, is, and I think it, it's, it's really great. I think it's actually what allows us to do a good job is that we're super honest with each other, painfully honest with one another. Brett, do not have the hook. I'm not. Nope. <laughs> well, everyone said it, all of it. <laughs> um, I could reiterate a little what Lindsay was speaking about, just in terms of a long line of, of strong um, women in my family. And I think I knew early on that it didn't really matter what I chose to do in life. If I, could, if, if I set my mind to it, it was OK, and that I could be anything I wanted to be. Um, and part of that was like um, being willing to work super hard. So my grandmother um, was a huge influence in my life. Um, really, I felt like letting me know early on, be whoever you want to be and be true to it um, and, and work really hard at it. If you really love it and believe in it, then go for it. And I think I really took that to heart. Excellent. fire this one at you. We talked a little bit about Jesse and Meredith, and my personal favorite again, Mrs. Squibbles. Um, but I think we all agree that there could be stronger female, a stronger female presence in animation overall. And just want to know, you know, why do you think that is, and what are we all doing about that to change it? 
one reason that it happened is that for generations, the people who went into animation were boys who loved comic books, who doodled in the margin. There weren't, girls weren't in, in, encouraged to go into a field like animation, and I think it didn't occur to them to do it. And I know from the school CalArts that Disney started and helps fund, a lot of Pixar story artists and anim animators are recruited from CalArts. And back when my husband, who's an animator, back when he went to CalArts, there were no females in his class. So when Pixar was recruiting, they didn't have women to choose from. And that has steadily changed over the years. And I heard recently that CalArts is pretty much 50-50 now. And I was so excited to hear that. And then I see that at Pixar reflected in our internship program. So while it's true that there are still many more men than women in my generation, many more men working in animation and in the industry at large, I'm very encouraged. I do some mentoring and workshops for the interns at Pixar. And I'm seeing it get more and more balanced with each passing year. So I feel really hopeful about that. Lindsay, you, we are, uh, you're all leaders in your individual uh, disciplines at Pixar. What qual qualities do you think make a great leader, aside from diplomacy, as we've just talked about? And what do you think, what unique qualities do you feel women bring to leadership positions? I saw this comedian once who described, um, and I'm sorry, it's a comedian, I'm attributing it to, I can't even remember his name. Um, but he basically said that men um, have uh, different folders in their brains for everything. So there's a folder for work, there's a folder for sports, there's a folder for family, there's a, everybody's got, they've got different kind of specific folders, and that women have one. And, and so at any given point, we can be accessing anything in our folder. We're watching TV and we're making lists of like, oh, I forgot the grapes, and I have to pack the lunches for tomorrow, or oh, I have to write this check for the pay the bill for the garden, I forgot about that. And, and then, like, literally, you go, like, honey, can we talk about, you know, if you're talking to your husband or whatever, and I'm like, so can we talk about the kids' camp somewhere? And he's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, can we talk about camp? I need to figure out camp for the summer. He's like, I'm. You can literally have it, you can see in his brain like this. Like, I have to switch folders. Hold on. <laughs> Watching sports. Um, so I do feel as though there is something about women's ability to multitask and to deal in chaotic environments and function kind of pretty well in those environments. That um, I'm making some gross generalization, and I apologize to all the men in the audience. Um, it's it, 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 different folders. Lovely, I love other folders. Um, so uh, I think there is something to the fact that, um, at least for me, it's like I, I was when I came to Pixar, I was like so gratified because I was like, I don't bring any skills. Everybody can draw, everybody can, you know, code or anything. They're like, but you can schedule. And I was like, I don't think that's very sexy. And they're like, no, no, it's amazing, you know. So um, I, I do feel as though for my, for my um, standpoint, one of the things that makes a successful production person is the ability to be a chameleon, the ability to walk into a room thinking you're going to lead a conversation and realize very quickly that you're just going to be an observer or a guide for that conversation because what needs to happen is somebody else needs to lead. Or walk into things saying, I'm just coming to listen, and then realize very quickly that you actually need to lead that conversation. Um, I'm a big believer in the Columbo effect. I ask stupid questions all the time. Um, it's amazing how many people don't and how um, many people actually don't understand what's happening and that when you just ask that, I'm sure everybody else gets it, can I just ask really quickly what you meant by that? Everybody's like, thank God she asked. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, 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 find it, um, I find it to be one of those, uh, um, one of the challenges and one of, the, one of the, the great things about my job is that I don't have to be any one person in any, in any, for any length of time. I get to change it up all the time. Um, I get to lead, I get to follow, I get to listen, I get to discuss, I get to debate, I get to agree. Um, and I get to say go or I get to say stop. And I, and I think that that for me is what makes my job really interesting and I also think there's something to um, kind of maybe the female single folder mind um, that allows you to kind of be jumping, for, um, be very facile with your, with your skills in any given um, room. So. Yeah.
Alex. <laughs> You're up next. That's your number one. <laughs> Triumph comes from adversity. Share with us a success or a life lesson that was born from a challenging situation in your career. Wow. Um, I, I think some of the, the best professional experiences I've had and most personal growth are the hardest projects you work on. Um, I've worked on a lot of crazy shows before Pixar. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I, I were, I'll say I was at Warner Brothers and they were starting a division and it was a brand new division and it was traditional animation and that's a lot of people and a lot of drawing and um, a lot of learning and that was a really, really, um, it was a hard show for a lot of people but for me, I got to be there day to day watching that happen and I got to see people like Steve Pilcher, who's a production designer of Brave be asked to take on more responsibility and partner with him um, and other people on taking more responsibility on that project and really seeing that uh, that project come together. And then um, it definitely struggled, but to see that team really face a really difficult situation and then really come out the other side, um, I think I learned more on that movie than, than I would have learned on a very easy movie. Um, and I think you make bonds on, on that kind of project that you you're just you're through, in the war together. And so like Steve Pilcher and Mark Anders are the people that I worked with on that show. Um, you get these real personal connections. Sorry, my phone. And um, you learn a lot about yourself. That's, I think some of the hardest projects are, are, are the most rewarding. Maybe not creatively, but definitely personally. So that was a great experience. Galen, what advice would you give women? Actually, would you give anyone who wants to get into the animation industry? <laughs> um, yeah, perseverance, tenacity, gotta have it. You gotta love it. But you, you gotta love, but you gotta love anything. You can. So I guess it's not different. Specifically for animation. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that if you love animation, sometimes you can be, I was having this conversation with my daughter this morning, she's, she's 12, she says, Mom, you know, when I grow up, I really want to work at Pixar, but I'm not a very good drawer. I said, honey, I've worked at Pixar for 23 years, and, and you know, circles and squares is pretty much where it's at for me. I can't draw at all. It's not about whether you can draw. It takes... It takes some, it takes a whole, it takes a village. <laughs> but it does, it takes hundreds of people with radically different disciplines and abilities and skills and, and the, really the only thing we have in common is a passion for the project that we're working on and hopefully we, what we try to instill also is, is a, a sense of mutual respect for each other's abilities. It's really, really important in the collaborative process. So learning that, that you can take whatever that skill is. It doesn't matter. There's a place for it within animation, and as long as you develop that to be the best it can be, and figure out how to apply it to the, to the process, and then having a huge love and respect for all of the other disciplines that come together to make, make these films. I think if, if you can do that, then, then you can find a way in animation. Um, discuss the importance of mentorship to you and who was an important mentor in your career as well as do you mentor anybody currently? Yeah. Um, so I feel like mentorship um, helps, you know, allow me to be an animator, frankly, because I, um, within the field of animation, since I'm self-taught, I actually relied on that and working with the animators at Pixar. Um, you know, there's some great old animators, Mark Oftedal, some of the old timeies would recognize his name, um, was amazing and just giving of their time um, to someone who was very green and new and I didn't know anything at all and just threw myself into it and they were amazing guides. 
I think later, um, you know, and, and animation is super collaborative. It's so important, even as an experienced animator, to really show your work and ask for that critique and ask for that, um, you know, ongoing in, a, in an odd way. It's like a continuing mentorship um, among, with everyone, because it is about working together and it is about critique and getting feedback and putting your all into something and then having them tell you that it's not very good and ripping it apart and doing it again. And so it's part of the, it's part of the process, really. Um, I think Tony Fucilli has been a great mentor for both myself and other animators at, at work. And I actually continue to mentor um, outside of Pixar, especially I teach at um, California College of the Arts. I teach animation. And I feel like through that, I'm able to help continue to give back to the field of animation and to the students. Um, it's been an amazingly rewarding experience. Um, and it's really awesome to be able to, you know, see some of these students who are so talented. Someone said earlier, you said, Lindsay, you'd never be hired today. And I'm like, I see all these students. I'm like, oh, I would never be hired today. <laughs> but it's amazing to be able to help foster, you know, um, in some of the, you know, green students and give them advice and, and kind of prod them on their way. So I am a major fan of, you know, kind of spreading the love and keeping it going. Excellent. You guys probably have some questions, but I first want to have a big hand. As I told you, I am impressed by these women every day. And I hope that. Hey, Lindsay, I just want to tell you really quick, I just graduated from Occidental in May, so go Tigers. Um, but I did want to ask all of you, I know maybe you can't say very much, but are there any female characters coming up in the already announced Pixar films that you are particularly excited about? Sorry, there's, there's more female characters. The exciting female upcoming characters. In any of the upcoming films? In the upcoming There films. are a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, Brett, what are you like to say? Dory, that's a Dory. Riley? Inside Out. Inside Out. It's like, it's so female. Inside Out is inside the brain of a young girl. And it's fascinating. And there's been a lot of good research. Pixar does so much research and so much thorough research. A lot about tween psychology went into the making of this film. And just a lot about girls and their friendships and the way their minds are wired. I think you'll find that one fascinating. And Galen is producing a wonderful TV special where you'll see Jesse get to really grow as a character. And I, that's probably what I'm most excited about right now. Where I'm not going to give anything away, Robin, I promise you. <laughs> Jesse, you know, she's always been a feisty and fun and uh, full of life character. And in this TV special, she gets really challenged and has to use her wit and her courage to overcome a really, really scary situation. And it's a comedy. It's a horror comedy. When I found out that, that you know, Angus, the director, wanted to pitch a horror comedy, I thought, really? <laughs> but it's wonderful. And, and she's the protagonist. And I'm excited that Pixar is now, you know, more and more of our films are having female protagonists. And she's just great in it. Brett, you were raising your hand. Did you have anything to add? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, I'm walking. Well, I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not thinking of other secrets away, but I think in Finding Dory, Dory is featured. <laughs> 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 Mother-daughter dynamic going there, so be good. Hi, how are you guys? 
Um, no, that's not the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, with so many, um, you know, females and all the different Pixar films, I figured I would ask you guys, um, out of all of them, which one would you feel relates to you? Like, you could say, like, wow, this character is so me, like, Dory is so me because I'm so forgetful, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys are around it all the time, I just figured, you know, at one point you might have been like, oh yeah, Merida is so me. <laughs> I think there's an online test you can take. I remember taking it a couple of years ago. I was like, around Pixar and said, which Pixar character are you? Oh, and I remember Andrew Stanton taking it and he was flick and he was like, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Training, the, the viewpoints training is all about staging. 
So it's funny the ways that my theater background come to play in my daily work in ways I never would have imagined. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Hi. Uh, okay, my question was, I read at Disney that they did this thing where they all like got together to kind of create the physical components of Flynn Rider. And because Pixar has such amazing women, like not as main characters, but like Helen and Dory and um, Ara, I was wondering, did you guys all, like, as women, come together and put in what kind of things you wanted as these female characters so that they were more developed, or just something like that? Well, we do, actually, um, my department is development, and especially on Inside Out, the one Pete Doctor's doing now, he did ask women in our department, and that included PAs, assistants, he had someone from accounting come. We gathered women to come and tell stories of moments in their tween years, so that sort of 10 to 13 is that tween, we all told our most embarrassing story from our tween years. And he really paid attention to those stories because that becomes one of many elements in the story. Um, I think that, yeah, there, there happened, it probably happens most in my department. Right. So you guys may not even know about it, but yes, we bring people in we brought in mothers of difficult teenagers, and my mom would have flown up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the mother, there were Pixar moms talking about their difficult teenagers, and then directors drawing inspiration from true stories. So it's a great question. Yeah, we absolutely do that. Well, and it's interesting because in animation right now, they've drawn, so in the pre-production of animation, you're really, exploring the characters and really developing their physicality and well, how would they act and what would they do and who is this character, who is this girl? And right now we have, I think, almost every available female in working on Inside Out right now. So they've really, I think, very actively done that on purpose. We learned certain times so this will be our last question. Kind of on the mother-daughter situation again. We've kind of seen it with Rapunzel, the mother that she had for most of the movie was not the best role model. But then Merida and her mother is much better. Will the Inside Out be like a continuation in a better parent-daughter role? The Inside Out's not, Inside Out is, is less of parent, um, it's more all kind of what's inside oh, this girl's head. Um, story though, where, you know, it's, it's, it's about family. Um, yeah. And we are, um, you know, and, and, the, and the, all different aspects of family, not the non-traditional families. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the goal is always to try to make something that feels right and true to the character and to the story you're making. And if the character kind of, if the story is saying that it needs to, they have to have a difficult family dynamic that they need to get over and get through and get past. Um, and that's the arc of the character in the story, or for, you know, even though it was a father, obviously, and Nemo with Marlon, um, you know, that was always at the core of the story, was, you know, the fact that his father, for very good reason, was stopping himself out of fear from being the best father he could be, and, and that was obviously his big growth in the course of the film, was figuring out how to let go and still love his child, um, and face his absolute worst fear. So I think we try to do, as we look at these stories and the directors um, and the writers think about these stories, we're always trying to make sure that we're being true to what that, what that character needs um, in terms of support from all the supporting cast around it and also um, on their journey, if you will, what, what roles each of those other people in their lives play in order to get them from point A to point B. So it's going to vary, I think, story to story, but it's never intentional for us to to portray parents in a, you know, in a good or bad light. I think it's always, it's always specific to the story we're telling. I want to thank these wonderful women for sharing this.